Good afternoon. Welcome to our season finale of Women Who Work. As usual, we define work as a woman or someone who is doing something to an exceedingly excellent capacity. And as always, our guests that we have today are two women who work. We have our Erie County Executive and a proud and distinguished alum of Edinburgh University, Kathy Dahlkemper, and my mother, the Reverend Dr. Laura Adams King, Superintendent of the Farrell Area School and Pastor of the New Life Family Worship Center in Franklin, Pennsylvania. Welcome, ladies. Thank you, great Thank to be you. with you. Um, today's show is focusing all on women in politics and in the realm of education. So we'll be asking them both questions that deal with those two subjects and also taking some questions that we receive via Twitter and Facebook. And um, we're gonna start with you, um, County Executive Dahlkemper. When you think of the phrase women in politics, what comes to mind? So I think of a number of things. First of all, I think of there's not enough. Um, we have few, too, few women, too few women still in the political realm. You know, women are 50% of the population, and yet we're very underrepresented. Um, I also think of strong women, women who have kind of led the way and been really pioneers in so many areas. You know, we've been lucky in our region. I'm the second female county executive, but that's also kind of rare in Pennsylvania. So um, I think of women who have uh, really taken on initiatives and moved them forward, but also uh, set a good example for other women and, and the possibilities there for them in political life. And when we turn to education, um, what are some of the developments that females have made in the field of education? Uh, in the field of education, females have basically gone from being just um, clerical staff support staff, be it in the cafeteria, the maintenance custodial department, and teachers to be administrators. Um, we still, as uh, County Executive Dahl Kemper just said, with, as with politics, we still don't have enough women in administration. The majority of women are still teachers that are in the educational setting. I'm moving on. Um, can you walk us through your political beginnings? How did you start? So I'm a little bit unusual from uh, most people who get into politics. I did it later in life, which is not all that unusual. But I was actually 50 years old when I decided to jump into politics. And prior to that, I'd never even worked anyone's political campaign. Always very interested in the issues uh, that were in front of us, whether they were local, state, or national, but never really got um, involved in the political process in a real way until uh, 2007 when um, I was, was very much against going into the Iraq for the Iraq war. There was a number of other issues happening in our country that was disturbing me and I think probably as many women we go into politics because we're passionate about something and we want to see something change and we want to make a difference and so I decided um, actually after I was asked and that's actually something else most women who are in politics were actually asked to run for office I was asked uh, by someone to run for the United States Congress. So um, after a lot of discussion with other people and soul searching and investigating into what this would entail, I decided to run for the United States Congress and for the 2008 election cycle. And so uh, I was successful. I, I beat a seven-term incumbent and served uh, two uh, short but very productive and important years in Congress because I was there, first of all, for the passing of the Stimulus Act, uh, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. I was also there uh, for one of, I think, the most important pieces of legislation in recent history, and that was the Affordable Care Act. Um, I was also the first Democrat in my seat in 32 years. This, uh, this part of Pennsylvania tends to be more conservative than maybe some other areas in Pennsylvania, and um, Democrats sometimes have trouble winning and then of course holding on to the seats and after um, my term in Congress I was not elected again in um, 2010 but I decided I still had more to give on the political realm and so then I ran for the county executive seat and won that seat and I've now been um, in this office for about two and a half years. Now can you speak to the educational experiences of marginalized women such as linguistics, cultural and racial or ethnic minorities? Uh, yes, I can. Um, I, I, unfortunately, I don't have the numbers for marginalized women um, in those specific groups, but let me talk about marginalized women, period, in, in education. Approximately 72% of women in education, or 72% of the teaching population in the United States currently, 
are women. However, when you look at administration, only 13% of them are women. So we are grossly underrepresented. When you look at 72% teachers, 13% in administration. Um, I, I got into this and I never intended to be an administrator, so I can understand why, um, because it's hard. This is a male-dominated field. And um, sometimes you have to work harder, um, strive more mm -hmm. in, in terms of, of trying to get there. Um, however, it, it is doable. Um, sometimes, and I think back on a statement that a, a colleague of mine made as we were talking, a female superintendent as well, and we were talking, and sometimes when our male counterparts are talked about as superintendent, they're saying that such and such is a really good superintendent. However, when, when, she, when she usually referred to us, they may say, um, Laura's a good superintendent and she's a woman, or Laura's a good superintendent and she's a black woman. So um, being a, a dual minority in there, it makes it sometimes a little more tedious. So while we're talking about being marginalized, what is it that you would say to um, a female that's looking to get into education being beyond a teacher that may be looking to be a future administrator, um, how do you encourage her? What do you give for advice? I would tell her to do it, unequivocally do it. It's one of the most rewarding experiences I've had. In your classroom, as with, with any administrator or any educator, in your classroom you impact um, the students in your classroom. As you go into administration, you get to impact, in a different way, a greater number of students. Um, there there are, are things you have to consider that as women, we are still women. We do still have things. We've got the kid responsibilities. We've got, and I did this later in life. Um, I never could have done this when you guys were smaller. So you have to take that into consideration as well. But I would say do it. Um, don't look back, make up your mind and, and go forward because it is definitely doable. Women bring something to the table as administrators that only women can bring to the table. And, and men do the same. But I think when you have, say for instance, if we had instead of 13% women, we had 50% women, 50% men, it would bring a greater balance. So I definitely encourage, and, and I'm trying to encourage some actually um, at my district and in our, our area to go into administration that have asked about it. Because when I was um, in school, and I've been out of school a couple of years, but when I was still in school, I didn't have any females to look at as administrators. There were no female principals, and there were certainly no female superintendents. So hopefully I'm serving as a role model for someone. Mm -hmm. And so there was a great point just brought up talking about women bringing something to the table mm -hmm. that men do not. So in that realm with politics, is there something that women bring to the table in politics that men do not? I think it's very similar in the fact that we bring a different voice. We bring a different set of experiences. We bring a different perspective. I always say that women aren't better lawmakers, aren't better legislators, aren't better um, executives in those type of political roles. But when we have more women representing women and men, we will have a better country, a better state, and a better community because we will have both voices equally at the table. And I think that is, that's really the key message here, is that having a greater diversity of voices will better represent the people and will bring forward other issues. And I think one of the most telling um, examples I can show of that is back in the 1990s, in the early 1990s, the National Institutes of Health did all of their studies on men and then tried to extrapolate that to women's health issues. For example, heart disease or certain types of cancer. So they weren't even studying breast cancer uh, in women and yet they were trying to extrapolate information they had about cancer and treating women for breast cancer or treating women for heart disease based on the models they were using for men. And the women of Congress um, actually, there was quite a few women that came in in 1992, and after that, the women saw this, and they said, this has to change. And now, the NIH, when they do their research, they do it equally on men and women and all of the diseases that might affect men or women differently. And so we are getting better health outcomes 
for women because of that, because even women's symptoms when it comes to heart attacks are very different than men's. So there it was, men, they probably might not think of that, but women saw the, the problem with this and they said, well, this has to change. So again, having that voice better serves the people as a whole. We also want to ask you the question as well. Um, what piece of advice do you give to um, future politicals, females? So first thing I always do is I ask women to run because again, as I said, many women have to be asked. And so asking women when I'm speaking in front of a group is, is really important to me because you have to hear that voice and you often have to hear it more than once. Um, as Laura said, do it, just go forward. And even if you don't want to run, I always suggest that you get involved with a political campaign Find someone you're passionate about or some issue you're passionate about and then take that energy forward and, uh, and either run or support somebody who is running because you will learn so much about yourself, you will learn so much about your community, and you'll be making a difference in our, in our community and in our country. Um, and, and I think lastly is believe in yourself. Uh, sometimes as women, we don't think we have enough yet. So we've got to go get another degree or we've got to get more experience or we've got to give ourselves more time or or whatever, and uh, men on the other hand tend to say, yeah, I can do this, and they just kind of jump up and do that uh, and run for office. So I think we have to have the confidence knowing that we have the skill set, we have the education, we have the intelligence, we have the experience that is so needed in our political sphere. Well, we've heard some great information thus far from both women. We're gonna take a short commercial break and we're gonna be back. We're gonna hear more about their influence and influences in both fields and get to know them a little bit better. We'll see you in the start while. Oh, we finally bought a place. Holy cow. You seriously have enough saved to do that? We've been putting a little aside each month. Mm -hmm. Jeez, by the end of the month, we have nothing left to save. Yeah, I have no idea where it goes. <laughs> well, you're mm -hmm. spending a lot on... Mm -hmm. Oh. Was it good? Oh, God. Oh, how is my account overdrawn? When it comes to financial stability, don't get left behind. Get tools and tips for saving at feedthepig.org. Hey, it's Ava and this is Tess from Do Your Selfie, where we recreate the hottest looks from today's biggest music videos. After cleaning out our closet, we have a lot of clothes we don't wear anymore. Like this old pile of t-shirts. It's not garbage, it's actually a new rug. And to make it, all you need to do is cut, tie, and glue. Cut the t-shirt into strips. Tie the strips into knots. And glue the knots to the bath mat. I love it. Give your garbage another life. And recycle. My parents always said that a bridge is only useful if it can be crossed. At Edinburgh, I found a university that connects who I am to who I want to be. A school that's affordable, with excellent professors and nationally recognized undergraduate and graduate programs who give personal attention to my success. Edinburgh is also a place with great traditions and big-time school spirit. Edinburgh University. It's the bridge to your destination. Choose excellence. Choose Edinburgh. Apply online at edinburgh.edu. The NCAA Division II Student Athlete Experience goes beyond the classrooms and playing fields. It means a commitment to service and community, helping organizations like the Make-A-Wish Foundation by raising money to help grant the wishes of children with life-threatening medical conditions, kids like Jacob. Some student athletes gave it their time and their energy to raise the money. It was fun to meet Jeff Gordon. NCAA Division II, training student athletes for lifelong achievement. We're back with Erie County Executive Kathy Dahlkemper and Reverend Dr. Laura Adams King of the Farrell Area School District. And we're continuing our theme that we're talking about today of politics and education and women in both of those fields. Um, we're just gonna talk for a minute about your political influences and your influences in education, sort of how you began to get started, who influenced you. Um, either one of you can start, whoever wants to talk mm -hmm. about it. Okay, sure. Um, <clears throat> I began in, in education actually um, as a school board member. Um, I, I was at home um, rearing children and there were some issues that I did not agree with and wanted to get involved with. And I had gone to some of our local school board meetings and um, thought maybe I had something to say. So something of value to say actually. So when the, an opening came up, I think the current board uh, president had resigned um, and the board could not make a decision 
about appointing a board member, I, I actually applied, put my name in the hat, and um, it ended up going to court. So I was appointed by uh, three of our, our county judges. And at the first meeting, as I said, it was the board president that had resigned. They needed to elect a board president. So um, Pennsylvania school boards have nine members. Um, and since I was the ninth member, there were four on one side, four on the other. They could not agree on a president. So somehow I was sitting there kind of dazed, had no idea what was going on. And I was elected board president. I actually stayed in that office about six years and um, became very intrigued with education. Um, in, in addition to that, I wanted to stress that to my children, the importance of education. Um, a, a mentor of mine, so I went back to school myself, a mentor of mine was actually an elementary teacher, third grade teacher, um, now deceased by the name of Martha Cromarty. And, and she inspired me because she was everything that I thought a teacher should be. And, and so as she inspired me and encouraged me, I wanted to be like Martha Cromarty. So um, I, while I stayed on that board 17 years and became a member of the Intermediate Unit Board, which is the central service agency for school districts in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, uh, I, I ended up getting hired, first of all, as a um, teacher's aide at my alma mater, the Farrell Area School District, and from there was hired as an elementary teacher and stayed in that position really had no aspirations of going into administration, but um, the more education you get, the more money you make, the higher you go on the pay scale. So I thought maybe this is something I, I could do. Um, I was encouraged to apply for some teachers actually asked me to apply for the high school principal's job when it became open. By then I had gotten my principal certification and um, I actually went from being a sixth grade teacher to the high school principal in a matter of months. So I stayed in that position. And, and as Kathy talked about being asked to be a politician, we had an interim superintendent at the time, or an acting superintendent. And he and I worked together for about two years. After working together for a few months, he told me, I think you'll be good as a <laughs> superintendent. You should consider doing that. I had I'd said I never wanted to be a superintendent because I did not want to have to deal with a school board. And I had been on a school board for so many years, I knew what boards did to superintendents and I did not want to do that. But after watching this man, Dr. Larry Conley, as my mentor, um, he was the most competent, most credible uh, superintendent I'd ever worked with. I, I thought he was phenomenal and he inspired, he was so good that he inspired me to be a superintendent as well. And so we created a plan that he would stay as the acting until I finished what in Pennsylvania is called the superintendent's letter of eligibility. And um, I became the acting superintendent first after he left and, and a couple months later I was um, elected by the school board as the actual superintendent. When I was elected as the acting superintendent, I did, was not elected unanimously. There were a couple that thought I did not have enough experience. Three months later after being the acting, I was elected unanimously by the ones, cause so even my critics um, were on my side and supporting me at that point. And so I became the first female superintendent in the school district, and I became the first uh, superintendent of color in Mercer County. And that was in 2010. And that's kind of my path to administration in the superintendency. Mm -hmm. Kathy, do you want to talk about your, who influenced you to get involved? So it's interesting because I, as I said earlier, I never had been um, really involved in politics. And going back to the numbers and the underrepresentation of women, there have been few role models um, in Pennsylvania, certainly on the congressional level. I was only the seventh woman ever, and still am the only seventh woman ever, uh, from Pennsylvania elected to the United States Congress. We've never had a United States Senator. We've only had seven women in the House. Um, we've never had a female governor. We've actually had very few women who've ever won a statewide election. Now, 
fortunately, locally, we have had better success with women being elected. Um, Judy Lynch was the first county executive. She was actually county executive for 20 years. And she was my old history teacher. When I was in high school, uh, she was my history teacher. And I guess I have to kind of go back to high school uh, because I was uh, taught by a lot of very strong women. I went to an all-girls school and uh, there was many nuns and other women there who taught all of us young women to uh, basically live a life of leadership and to find your passion and to go forward and to you know, do good things in, in our world. So it was through those women who taught me um, that I think I gained a lot of my leadership skills and it allowed me to uh, jump into this area of politics later in life, although I took on many other leadership positions in, in various organizations before that time. And I have to say my mother was a person too who, uh, when she was very passionate about issues, she jumped in and, and got very involved even if she didn't do it for a career. So I, I was always raised to, to speak up and to, uh, to do something to change the world. And I feel very strongly, um, maybe going back to my Girl Scout days, that uh, you should always leave the world better than you found it. You know, if you take a walk in the woods, leave it better than you found it. And so this is a way for me to do that, something that's, I think, part of my core belief. So I think there was a number of women um, along my path who um, supported me and mentored me and helped me um, see that I could do it when I decided to run for office. But in terms of actually having many images to look at, you know, I was the first woman elected uh, to Congress from our part of Pennsylvania. There really weren't many women to look at and emulate. And that's, uh, I think, one of the things that has kept many women from getting into politics is they haven't had a lot of role models. There's more and more all the time. And of course, currently, we have a woman who's probably going to be a candidate for the highest office um, in the country. And all the time, every time one of those things happens, um, I think it gives women more permission to kind of step up and step into this world of politics. Uh, and then I have to say, once I went to Congress, there was many women there that I tapped into. And it's, it's not an easy um, position to hold and, and still stay attentive to your family and to your own personal needs. And, and so I really leaned on a lot of the other women in Congress for advice, for mentorship in terms of, um, first of all, how do you navigate Congress? And then secondly, how do you continue to uh, make sure your personal life is not negatively affected? And so there's a lot of great women there that I, that I met along the way. Um, and I have to even say Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who went to Congress when she was 50, had five children, I have five children. She and I talked, especially when I first got there, about just that transition of coming out of um, a life that's really not that political, although I think she was more political than I was before I came to Congress, but you know, how do you navigate um, all of those type of um, personal issues as you're traveling back and forth to Washington and you have so many demands on your time and, and there's so much to absorb and learn, um, especially when you first take on a position like that. So there's many people um, that I would say along the way have uh, positively affected my ability to, to be a good leader in the political realm. Now, for both of you, what's one experience or memory that you have um, in both of your fields that you don't mind sharing with the rest of us today? Well, I think for me, um, you know, a memory, there's two memories I think that will always stick with me. Uh, the first was that I was very fortunate to be um, sworn into Congress two weeks before President Obama was sworn in as president. And so I had truly a front row seat to the inauguration of um, President Obama, our first African-American president. And it was a glorious day in Washington, freezing cold, two million people there. As far as the eye could see, as, you would, as I sat up there in front of the Capitol, uh, looking out onto the sea of people down the mall in Washington, um, people everywhere. And um, it was one of those moments where I had such hope, and it was just such a wonderful testament to our country. And, maybe where we had come, particularly in terms of racial relations. Um, no one was arrested that day. No one in Washington was arrested in that area. Two million people there. Um, at the end of the day, and I came out of the Capitol, I remember there was this long line of people waiting to get into the subway system. And they were all just happy and talking to each other and peacefully standing in line as they knew they would have a long wait before they could even get down into the subway system and get out of there. And, it was just the whole day, I think, the whole um, scene and just being part of really history 
in the making was, was a tremendous um, experience and I'm just very honored that I was able to do that. And then I think the second is uh, the passing of the Affordable Care Act. It was a, it was a long uh, process to get to that. I was part of the uh, summer of uh, town hall meetings, which became very contentious. And, um, and then, you know, passing of the House bill, passing of the Senate bill, then um, fin the final bill, and, and just that whole process and being part of something that truly uh, will go down in history as um, a landmark piece of legislation. And, and I had a front row seat to it. Um, the piece, the Young Invincible piece, where young people get to stay on their parents' health insurance until they're 26. That was the bill that I authored and got rolled into the full legislation. And I know every day that millions of young people, um, young adults, go to, that they're, uh, I go to bed at night knowing that they're insured and that they're taken care of. And so um, I think those are two memories, um, two important things that will always be part of uh, what I can say would be my legacy. I know some of our audience members are probably happy about that last part. <laughs> uh, do you want to share your memory or experience? Sure. Um, my, my first one actually involves a student um, and, and during my teaching days. But uh, any educator uh, in the audience can tell you that, that sometimes when you're, when you're teaching and, and when you're, you're dealing with a student, then you don't always know the impact right away that you're having on a student. It may be many years later. And um, it was about a year ago, actually, that I heard from a student that I probably had 10 years ago that I had no idea I was reaching, but, but God knows I was trying. And um, the, the student came from a, a single parent family, was being reared by dad. Um, slept in class, wasn't the, wasn't the neatest, wasn't the, the stellar student. And, and anyway, I actually heard from this student um, about, like I said, about a year ago. And, and it brought tears to my eyes because the student talked about how I had reached him. And he talked about what he was doing in life now and, and how he credited me for that and how he wanted to be uh, a teacher or an educator like I was so he could impact students the way I impacted him. And that has to be every educator's dream to know that you finally reached a kid. So, so that's a, definitely a memorable experience for me that, that I, I will always keep on the hard drive of my mind um, for the rest of my life. Uh, another is my first year as high school principal um, it, it wasn't the best situation that I got hired into, but it, it's up to you always what you make out of it. And, and I remember this, the special assistant to the Secretary of Education for the Commonwealth came into my building and we were walking the halls. And, and he, he pulled me to the side and he said, what you've done here is remarkable. And I didn't understand why he thought it was remarkable. He said, because I don't know whether you realize it or not, I, and he named a school district that he had gone into, and, and basically the state had taken over, and that's when the state was taking over districts. And he named this district that had been taken over. I was very familiar with it, and he said, I'm the one that did that, and he said, believe it or not, this one was next on the list. Hmm. And he said, and you know, that's not gonna happen now. He said, because girl, what you have done here, and those were exact, exact words, girl, what you have done here is just phenomenal. Um, I, I would love to take credit for that. However, you have to realize in leadership, unless you have people following you, all you're doing is taking a walk. So that's a credit to, to my staff. It's a credit to the students. It's a credit to parents and guardians and to the community. But, but those are two experiences that I will always remember. And at that time, we had what was called AYP. That was the state measuring rod, um, adequate yearly progress. And my building had made AYP for the first time ever. Wow. Those are both great memories. Thank you for sharing. Um, our last question that we're going to ask today is, if you were not in politics, if you were not in education, what would you be doing? I um, can't imagine at this point that I wouldn't be in politics. And I say that um, because I found my passion. And um, I mean, I did a lot of other things before I got into politics. But I think uh, over time, I've realized that I'm 
in a place where I, where I should be right now. I'm in a place where I can take all of my interests, because my interests are many. You know, I was a dietitian for many years. That's, I graduated from Menborough with a degree in dietetics. I worked in uh, environmental issues for a long time. Um, I'm a mother of five, and I care very deeply about the vibrancy of my community so that my children and grandchildren can have a great life. And so what I have found, um, first of all, I like the local politics better than Washington. Um, so, I mean, Washington was phenomenal, but you can actually get so much more done on a local level, and you can impact people's lives um, so greatly and, and so immediately, I guess, compared to kind of these bigger pieces of legislation and things you're working on in Washington. So um, I find what I'm doing now is something I'm so passionate about, and there's so much work to be done yet. Um, I've been in this position about two and a half years, but there's so much work to be done. And every day, there's something new that comes in front of me. So uh, if I wasn't in politics right now, I think I'd be looking for how do I take the passions I have and, and, and using that in a good way. So I can't imagine um, going back now that I'm in this position to something different because this is really where I believe I belong at this particular point in my life. Okay. To, to answer that question, um, there, there's, there's a book uh, that I read some years ago, A Purpose Driven Life, and um, there's a chapter in there about fulfilling your purpose and finding what your purpose is. So I, I really believe what I'm doing now, I'm, I'm fulfilling my purpose. This is one of the reasons why I was born. I, I'm doing what I'm, I was put on earth to do. But everything that I do centers around two things. It centers around um, education, or it centers around religion. Everything, every board that I'm on, everything that, that um, my extracurriculars, everything that I'm involved with outside of work. So if I were not um, an educator, and you've already talked about and mentioned that I'm the pastor of, of, a, mm -hmm. uh, of, of a church in, in Franklin, Pennsylvania, if I were not an educator, I would be in full-time ministry. I wouldn't be bivocational. And it's hard to say not being in full-time ministry because I don't know how you do um, ministry without being in it full-time. Um, because I, I do that in the evenings. I do it during the day. I'm there on weekends. It's so much a part of my life and who I am even as an educator. Um, even though there's a separation of church and state, uh, I am who I am. And so if I were not, as I said, in um, education, that's what I would be doing. And, and one day, when I retire, um, those are my plans. I don't know if I'll fully ever retire from education, because um, I think once an educator, you're always one, but um, full-time ministry will certainly be on the horizon for me. Great, just final thoughts as we're here on the campus of Edinburgh and we're surrounded by our future leaders, our future educators. Um, Edinburgh produces a lot of our educators and some future politicians. Um, what would you say to them? What are your parting words to say um, to our next generation? I, I would say to our, our next generation, someone once said, find a job you love and you'll never work a day in your life. I would agree. I love going to work. I don't always like the things I have to do, but I love going to work each and every day. There's never a day that I hate going to work. So find something that you're passionate about that will pay, okay, <laughs> and, and do that. Um, secondly, everyone needs to be represented. That's why I think it's so important for what um, the, the county executive, Dahl Kemper, does and what I do because everybody, women, minorities, men, tall people, short people, everyone deserves to be represented. And, and everyone needs to see, if they're interested in a field, they need to see that there's someone that looks like them, that has their specific background in that field so that they know it's doable and attainable. So if for no other reason, if you don't see anyone that looks like you, that is like you, that has your experiences, that's in the field you want to be in, and doing the things that you want to do, you go ahead and do it anyway. If you can't find an example, be an example for someone else because everybody needs an example and a role model. Just find your passion and do it. Life is short. You don't have a lot of time to fool around with it. 
So whatever it is you're going to do, by all means, do it. I think a couple things I would say to the students, and uh, uh, there's probably two camps. There's a group that maybe thinks they want to get into politics someday, and there's a group that says they will never get into politics. So I'll speak to both of those. Um, for the people that think they want to get involved in politics, um, they often ask me, what, what, what's your advice? I'm a college student. I don't see myself running for office right away. What should I do? And I always say, um, get involved in a number of things from different aspects, you know, whether it's whatever your job is, your extracurricular activities, your volunteer work, because if you do want to get into politics, the wider group of uh, friends and acquaintances and people that you know, the better, because not only will you have those people who hopefully know you and then maybe can support you, um, but you'll also learn a lot, and you need to have that kind of wide breadth of knowledge if you're going to get into any kind of a political office. You'll be dealing with things from um, the environment to health care to economic development and on and on. So having that kind of breadth of experience is, is I think, a very good thing. Um, and, and then when you do decide to get involved, whether it's working for someone or, or running yourself, um, always keep that open mind and listen to other people. It's really important not just to talk, but to truly listen. And when you listen to other people, even if you don't agree with them, if they're on a different place on the political spectrum than you, you can learn from them and you can have more empathy and compassion for why they believe what they do. And then for those who think they never want to get involved, I say, please don't close that door because we really need people to be involved in the political system. Whether it's running for office or supporting somebody that you believe in running for office, you will, as I said before, you will learn a lot about yourself and about your community. But you know, we're not a democracy if we don't have people running and we don't have good people running, we're going to continue to, uh, I think, see further and further divide in our country. So we need good people to get up, to be involved, and to be part of our political system. It, our, our, really, our country depends on that. And, um, and don't forget about local politics. This is a presidential year. Everybody thinks about the presidential election. But truly, your local elections will affect your life much more than those um, national elections. So get out there, get informed, vote. That's the first thing, you know, get registered and get uh, and to vote. But remember, this is our country. This is our community. This is our state. And it really is up to all of us to be involved in that process if you really want to move this um, community and this country to a better place. Well, as we close with our season finale episode, I'd like to thank our county executive and my mom um, for being here today. Um, this has been a great season. We've had great women who have done phenomenal things, but the common thread has been, in order to be a woman who works, you can't do it alone. It takes tenacity, it takes faith, community, and hard work, and most importantly, purpose. So whatever your purpose or path may be, we ask that you find it and make a difference and do it working. Have a great day, and we will look forward to seeing you next season.